NBC Charlotte breaking the bombshell today of a corruption scandal in Charlotte. Mayor Patrick Cannon arrested on federal corruption charges. NBC Charlotte received a tip from a confidential source, and we broke this story on air. And we were the only ones in the courtroom when the charges were read to him. Tonight, Mayor Cannon faces charges of theft, bribery, wire fraud, and extortion. We have a team of reporters covering every angle of this still developing story. We begin, though, with NBC Charlotte reporter Rad Berkey. He was the only reporter in the courtroom when Mayor Cannon faced a judge for the first time today. Rad, how did he seem? Well, Pat Cannon seemed absolutely stunned, Dave, as he sat there in the courtroom. You know as well as I do that politicians love the public eye, but certainly not like this, sitting alone in a courtroom listening as a judge reads you these serious public corruption charges. Take a look at the lengthy complaint here. This accuses Cannon of accepting various bribes from undercover FBI operatives who were posing as real estate developers looking for Cannon to smooth the way for their pro projects. At one point, he's accused of actually taking 20 $20,000 in cash in his own office at the government center after his release on $25,000 bond. I was waiting outside the courthouse to question him. Can you give me any reaction at this point, Mr. Mayor? Uh, none at this point, but we'll be certainly willing to talk to you a little bit later on, okay? What well, happened? You. Can you tell us what happened? Well, nothing at this point that I can discuss, but I'll certainly be back in contact with you about it. What would you tell the voters of the city today, sir? Well, there's not too much I can say at this point, so, but uh, when I'm able to, I'll certainly touch base back with you. What is your reaction to the charge? Guilty? Not guilty? Uh, you know, at this point, there's nothing to respond to at this juncture, so I'll, I'll certainly circle back with you, though. Thank what you. Gotcha. Now, one thing the FBI complaint says is that the Bureau has much of this investigation captured on audio and on videotape. As this case proceeds, and if it does go to trial one day, that's when we will hear and see what the FBI says it has on tape as evidence against Patrick Cannon. Reporting live at the Government Center, Rad Berkey, NBC Charlotte. Thanks, Rad. The FBI also searching Mayor Cannon's house. We've learned just what they're looking for here. Federal agents seize things like cell phones, tax forms, and information in a brown fossil briefcase. NBC Charlotte anchor Ben Thompson is live in front of the mayor's house in Ballantyne this evening. Ben? Dave, I want to give you a look at the scene here behind me. That row of cars going up this street, those are all unmarked FBI cars. You can see one Charlotte Mecklenburg police car here in the foreground that's actually handling some uh, traffic issues. There in the background, that is Mayor Cannon's house. Now, earlier, his wife actually left the house. We were the only ones here. I asked her and gave her a chance to defend her husband. Take a listen. Is there anything you'd like to say? Anything in defense of Mr. Cannon? As you heard, silence from her. His mother also here at the house. She came out to her car earlier when we were here. She also said nothing. Of course, this is the home where the mayor lives with his wife and three kids. Uh, they've been married for uh, some 17 years. FBI agents been here since 2 o'clock this afternoon when we first arrived here. We were the first ones here. We know they're looking for things. Dave, like you mentioned, receipts, tax forms, appointment books, uh, calendars, uh, even things so specific as a fossil briefcase even iPad, uh, even perhaps guns, uh, as ordered by the judge we know uh, this afternoon in court. Uh, we've been speaking to neighbors here around the neighborhood. In just general terms, I can tell you that they are absolutely stunned by this news, uh, as much of Charlotte is, neighbors are as well. They had no idea something like this would happen. Also, one other thing we should add is the big question, where is Patrick Cannon right now? As we alluded to at one point this afternoon, we know that his wife and his mom were here at the house. We do not know, though, where he might be at this hour. Reporting live in Ballantyne, Ben Thompson, NBC Charlotte. All right, Ben, and NBC Charlotte cameras caught FBI agents searching easy parking at 300 West Trade Street. Mayor Canna is the chief executive officer of that business. We saw several FBI vans on the scene. They're among the items the FBI is looking for there, a financial records for Cannon and his wife, tax forms, and mobile telephones. NBC Charlotte I-Team reporter Stuart Watson is combing through the 42-page criminal complaint. He is live in the studio right now with a closer look at the charges the mayor is facing. 
Well, Angie, this 42-page sworn statement from an FBI agent is not at all dull reading. It tells us the Fed's version of backroom meetings, secret phone calls, a Las Vegas trip, and tens of thousands of dollars in cash. The FBI affidavit says that the agent made the first cash bribe by placing $12,500 in cash on a coffee table, at which point the FBI says Cannon looked nervously toward the window and covered the money with a folder. The undercover agent got up and closed the blinds, at which point they say Cannon placed the money near his ear and fanned the bills. But later, Cannon called the undercover agent to say, I'm not one of those Chicago or Detroit type folk. That's not how I flow. But in a much later conversation, when Cannon was bragging about his political connections, even in the White House, the undercover agent says, you haven't even hit the pinnacle of your political career yet, have you, Patrick? It will be fun to watch you the next 10, 15, 20 years. Watch where you go. And of course, the double entendre there, the agent or Patrick Cannon hearing, watch where your political career will go. The FBI agent knowing, watch if you are going to prison for 10 or 15 or, or 20 years. But of course, what we're hearing now is the FBI's version of events. We can't stress that enough. We haven't heard from Patrick Cannon. Angie. All right, Stuart, thank you. And here's a little more uh, of, on Cannon's background. He was raised by a single mother. He was first elected to office at the age of 26. He's married with three children, and he was elected mayor on November 5th last year. Now, we recently sat down with Cannon just this month to talk about his first 100 days in office. He hit the milestone just two weeks ago, and we asked him what he was most proud of during that period. He told us the number of jobs he's created, some 1,400 jobs. Governor Pat McCrory reacted by saying, I'm both saddened and angered because I've known Patrick and his family for over 30 years. But more than anything, my heart is broken for the city of Charlotte. He goes on to say, this is not the city that I know, served, and loved. This alleged behavior is inexcusable and cannot be tolerated. Now, word spread quickly of the charges. NBC Charlotte reporter Diane Gallagher is live in Uptown tonight at the Government Center with reaction there. Diane, we just heard from city leaders. Yeah, David, you know, it seems that city leaders found out around the same time that our own Rad Berkey found out and was at the federal courthouse today. They they were really shocked when they came in here. We'd waited for about two hours on the second floor of the government building for city leaders to come and make a statement. Council members and city manager Ron Carley finally came in about 445 to talk to us about their reaction to Mayor Patrick Cannon's arrest. Here's what they had to say about how they found out. We were notified today at the same time as the public that Mayor Patrick Cannon was arrested on federal charges. The city council is deeply disappointed to learn of, mayor's, of the mayor's arrest. Our thoughts and prayers are with his family. His arrest came as a complete surprise to the city council and the city manager. The first any of us learned about the investigation is when the FBI served a search warrant on the mayor's office at noon today. The city manager and city attorney have spoken with the U.S. attorney and committed the city's full co cooperation. The city manager has also directed that all city staff fully cooperate. The city of Charlotte has a long history of honest government and the city council is dedicated to preserving the city's reputation. Now, I asked City Manager Ron Carley if anybody had spoken with Mayor Cannon since his arrest. None of the council members had. Ron Carley said that he did speak with him briefly, told him that he was praying for his family. I asked if he was going to ask the mayor to resign. He said that that conversation has not taken place, did not elaborate on if it would take place. City Council does not have the power to remove the mayor. For now, reporting live at the government building, Diane Gallagher, back to you. Diane, thank you. Folks everywhere are buzzing about the news. NBC Charlotte report Reporter Bora Kim is on the streets of Charlotte and has some of your reaction. Yes, and we were in Uptown this afternoon, in some cases breaking the news of these federal corruption charges to members of the public, while others told us that it was the talk in the office all afternoon. Now, for many visitors I spoke to, it really doesn't bode well for the reputation of the city, but whether they work here, live here, or just move here, the general reaction that Mayor Patrick Cannon was arrested and indicted on corruption charges is that of utter disappointment. My I'm just really surprised that it went on for four years before anyone was able to really find out and see what 
what was going on? It's definitely a, a disappointment. I feel when you're in a position of a mayor, any any position that has a title, you know, people trust you. You're very you're trustworthy individual. So for for a person of that power to to take that power for granted, it's definitely a disappointment. It's definitely nothing that you want to see. And surely speaking with uh, people in the public, uh, they conveyed to me their disappointment because they saw Mayor Patrick Cannon as quite a role model, especially for young children in the area. And although uh, this still really has to play out in the court and these are uh, mere allegations, uh, they say that it is still disappointing to see that the mayor is in such a position. Reporting from the Government Center, Bora Kim, NBC Charlotte. Laura, thank you. NBC Charlotte is committed to following this breaking story. We'll have another live update in just minutes on NBC Charlotte News at 530, and we'll bring you any new developments on air and online at WCNC.com. And now to more breaking news. We want to show you some photos just into the newsroom from Charlotte Douglas Airport, where a U.S. Airways flight was forced to abort takeoff this afternoon. A spokesperson for the airline says there was an indication of a possible mechanical issue, so the pilot aborted takeoff to New Orleans out of an abundance of caution. The plane taxied back to the gate. All 119 passengers on board are being put on other flights. Cold, cold, cold weather today, but there is some warmer weather on the horizon. Coming up, I'll let you know when we're going to see the 70s return to your forecast. Next on NBC Charlotte at 5, what the TSA wants added to airport checkpoints to help keep them safe. Plus, oh, oh, no. Oh, 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 my God. Terrifying moments caught on camera. A construction worker stuck on the top floor of a condo complex as it goes up in flames. And continuing coverage of that breaking news, Mayor Patrick Cannon arrested on corruption charges. NBC Charlotte, the first to break this story on air. Stay here for all the latest developments. Still developing this evening, a recommendation by the TSA. They want armed officers posted at airport security checkpoints during peak hours. This recommendation comes after a nationwide review in response to a shooting at LAX last fall where a TSA officer was killed in that attack. Since then, law enforcement, airline and airport operators have met multiple times to discuss ways to improve airport security. Well, today, school bus drivers in Charlotte and across North Carolina are counting the number of cars that ignore their stop sign arms. Look at this here. Our cameras caught cars doing just that yesterday. Bus drivers hope a statewide count will bring attention to the problem that puts kids at risk every day. Last year, just in Mecklenburg County, bus drivers counted 721 offenders in one day. By the way, if you're caught and convicted, expect to pay a $500 fine. All right, still ahead, cell phone video captures a dramatic rescue. Hundreds of feet in the air as fire crews scramble to save a worker stranded on the balcony of a burning apartment building. Plus, a Salisbury restaurant becomes a crime scene as an off-duty deputy fatally shoots a gunman robbing that restaurant. We'll have the latest information when we come back. And one more deep freeze tonight with temperatures in the 20s, but we're going to start that warm-up coming up in my seven-day forecast. Our breaking news coverage of Mayor Cannon's arrest continues. NBC Charlotte was the only TV station to speak with him right after he walked out of federal court facing corruption charges. He told reporter Rad Berkey he had nothing to say to voters until more information is available. Our crews have also been at the mayor's Charlotte home, which is being searched right now. We are on top of this story and we'll bring you details as they develop. When we're not on the air, we'll have updates at WCNC.com. Well, restaurant workers cheered after an off-duty cop shot and killed a masked gunman who tried to rob the place. NBC Charlotte reporter Michelle Bowden spoke with one of those customers who was inside the China Buffet in Salisbury when this happened. She joins us live now with the latest, a wild story, Michelle. Yeah, hey, Dave, want to get you the latest details. We now know the name of the officer, 41-year-old Mark Kempf. He's a Rowan County Sheriff's deputy based at the jail, fairly new on the job. He was just hired back in May, but tonight the people that were inside that restaurant are calling him a hero. Most of the customers, about two dozen people, were just finishing up dinner. James, an off-duty firefighter and EMT, and his wife among them. I looked up and he was to my right. He had the rifle aimed at, I suppose, at the cashier. Police say a man with a bandana over his face started waving a shotgun as he walked through Salisbury's China Buffet trying to find the cashier. He went past us and I knew he's going to have to come back past us to get out. Um, and I was wondering um, 
what, what I was going to do next. He didn't have to. Instead, an off-duty police officer also there eating dinner sprang into action. I saw the police officer. He was up and had taken a stance and he announced himself and um, pop, pop, pop and it was over. Employees began to clap. I think he did exactly what um, you expect a police officer to do. Um, and um, I was grateful he was there because uh, if he had not been there, uh, uh, any number of things could have happened. At this point, authorities have not released the name of the suspect involved in all of this. The Rowan County Sheriff's Department has done an internal investigation and cleared their deputy, but the DA will make the final decision on that. The SBI is continuing to investigate. Reporting live now in Salisbury, Michelle Bowden, NBC Charlotte. Well, as we've seen today, a lot of sunshine out there, okay. which is great, but cooler temperatures, but a big warm-up is on the way, Brad. Yeah, huge warm, especially compared to what we've had recently. Now, it's going to be cold again tonight. We're going to have a hard freeze with temperatures well down into the mid-20s, slightly warmer tomorrow. We're going to be closer to 60 degrees, but with the warm weather returning, we have the opportunity with some spring like storms both Friday and I think Saturday, especially a day to watch. Temperature now 50 degrees. That has been our high temperature for the date. The temperature started down at 24 this morning. One of the coldest readings we've seen this late in the season. We haven't seen a low this cold this late. Uh, in, in, since probably 2007, you have to go back to that uh, Easter freeze we had that year. I think it was on April 8th that year. We got down into the upper teens and low 20s, mostly sunny skies. There's our nor'easter pulling away from us right now. That's a massive storm. This is the strongest system in the Atlantic in the last two years. I mean, you have to go back and, and look at maybe the 1993 superstorm to see a storm that strong. This would have been stronger if it was a hurricane than any storm in the hurricane season last year in the Atlantic. Just goes to show you how strong that system was, and thankfully it moved well offshore and didn't impact the Carolinas. Freeze warnings up for the Piedmont again tonight. Growing season has started, so that means the temperature will be well down into the 20s by tomorrow morning, uh, likely in a few spots even colder than it was this morning. Now, the cold weather has relaxed the pollen levels just a bit. But with the warm air returning and a southwest wind, we're going to see those pollen levels start to ramp back up. And here's the reason why high pressure builds in pretty quickly tonight and tomorrow. We'll get into a southwest wind, which should warm us up close to 60 tomorrow. On Friday with southwest winds, we could get in uh, close to 70. And I think on Saturday with this low approaching, we're really going to pull up some warm air. That's going to do two things. It might get us into the low and mid 70s, but it's also going to give us a chance for some strong, possibly severe storms along this cold front late uh, Saturday afternoon into the evening. It's certainly something I'm going to keep an eye on as we go into the evening hours on Saturday. Now tonight we'll see clear skies in the mountains with temperatures in the teens here in the Piedmont. We'll drop down into the low and mid 20s, so a hard, hard freeze again tonight as you go east of Charlotte, clear skies and temperatures in the 20s. When you look at the five day temperature trend, we're finally going to see temperatures get back to where they should be above 67, which is our average high brief cool down on Sunday. But when you look at the seven day forecast, nice rebound in temperatures as we go into next week, we'll see temperatures temperatures maybe by this time next Wednesday in the mid to upper 70s and dare I say maybe even a few spots getting close to 80 degrees. Mm. I don't mind at all. You can say that <laughs> all you want. Yes. Brett. All right. All. Well, dramatic cell phone video captures the rescue of a worker on the upper floors of a building that became engulfed in flames. Yeah, the scene played out yesterday afternoon in Houston, Texas. Oh my God. Where? Do they see him? Terrifying moments oh caught on camera by a woman in the building next door. This construction worker got stuck on the top floor of the condo complex. Frantically waving at rescuers, he eventually jumps to the balcony below to escape the flames. Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. Lucky for him, Houston firefighters were on their way. They raised the ladder up and rescued him. Oh thank, oh, thank Jesus. Thank you, God. Senior Captain Brad Hawthorne was on the edge of that ladder and made the save. I said, all right, come on. And uh, he had to make the leap, so he, he kind of jumped and <laughs> grabbed on. And I said, hang on. Within a couple seconds, right, the, 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 the roof caved in and the whole fifth floor kind of went out. Hawthorne admits at that moment his adrenaline was pumping. It was pretty hairy. It was, uh, I mean, just the noise from the fire. It was uh, just the cracking and popping of all that, uh, the wood. It was, it was pretty loud. The captain says this rescue wouldn't have been possible without help from these guys. They worked together at Station 18. Dwayne Weibel is a chauffeur. He was behind the wheel of the ladder truck. It was his job to put it in the perfect position for a safe rescue. They all admit this fire was intense, one of the worst they've seen. You just don't see five floors burning all at once. This is one of the fastest growing fires that I've ever been to. I mean, it just it, it ran that whole roof and that whole building so fast and seconds count. 
That construction worker is fine. In fact, these are his co-workers. They tell us they were all doing stucco work on some of the walls when the fire started suddenly. Everyone's just thankful this story has a happy ending. He was, he was good talking to me and, uh, you know, just excited, thanking us a lot. Well, it took nearly 200 firefighters more than two hours to bring that five alarm fire under control. The cause is under investigation, but fortunately no one was hurt. And those pictures are just amazing to see, isn't it? Yeah, when you see the intensity of those flames, it is unimaginable that somebody got out of that alive. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, as we had to break here, a live look at Uptown Charles. Beautiful day out there, but only 50 degrees, but a lot of sunshine. A big warm up is on the way. Back with more in a moment. Take a look here at a basketball that talks to you. This is a smart sensor basketball. Its goal is to improve how players shoot and handle the ball. As players run through drills to build muscle memory, they constantly hear and see coaching tips through an app. It costs around $250. InfoMotion Sports says it's also working to create a, a smart soccer ball that it hopes to unveil later this year. That's something I don't need. It's, you miss that <laughs> shot over and over and over. Bad shot, bad shot, right, bad yeah. shot. I don't yeah. need to be reminded of that either. <laughs> Would not do me any good. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. Well, do stay with us this afternoon because we do have continuing coverage on the arrest of Charlotte Mayor Patrick Cannon. That is coming your way at 530. Stay right here. Mayoral scandal in the Queen City. Tonight, the I-Team uncovers we've been on top of this for years. New information about Patrick Cannon's past from the former mayor himself. It's inappropriate, in my opinion, to go out and use your title for, uh, for something that might uh, give you the edge. Plus, what happened in Vegas didn't stay in Vegas. Cannon's trip to Sin City to meet with undercover feds. And who might step in as Charlotte's next mayor? It all starts right now on NBC Charlotte at 5. And good evening to you. I'm Anjanette Flowers. And I'm Dave Wagner. Day two of a political scandal unfolding right here in Charlotte. Our coverage continues of former Mayor Patrick Cannon's arrest and his resignation. From city leaders to the general public, things are just sinking in. The accusations in yesterday's warrant do not portray the way the city of Charlotte works. I feel like it's not a good representation of our city. It's not a good example. Live outside his home right now, things look quiet, but there has been a lot of activity there since his arrest. Our camera spotted FBI agents seizing boxes and boxes of evidence. And here are the charges Cannon is facing. Theft, bribery, wire fraud, and extortion. He resigned from his position as mayor last night. Meantime, reaction continues to pour in. We have a team of reporters covering this big story this evening. We're digging deeper and taking a look at every angle. We begin this evening with NBC Charlotte reporter Michelle Bowden, who just heard from city manager Ron Carley on what's next for the city of Charlotte. Michelle? Hey, Dave, he just wrapped up that news conference, and the first thing he wanted to make clear, both to the people that live in the city of Charlotte and to the people that work for the city of Charlotte, that today it was business as usual. He says there was a lot of shock in the building, both from employees, from him especially, yesterday. But he says today people came back to work. They were ready to work. He actually spent some time today talking to employees by video, trying to reach as many of them as possible to make it clear that the city is more than just one man, that the city will continue its business. He tried to tell us how many calls came into 311, that sewer went on as normal, water and trash pickup went on as normal, really trying to get across the point that the city, it is business as usual. He did say he knows, he is well aware that in the affidavit the city is mentioned, that he is mentioned. He says they are cooperating with federal investigators and that's why he would not address any questions about the actual investigation. He says he's confident there won't find any more wrongdoing on behalf of the city, but they are continuing to cooperate. Take a listen to what he said just a few minutes ago. This event does not affect how the city of Charlotte operates on a day-to-day -day basis. Charlotte is led under the council manager form of government, which means that the city manager, my responsibility, oversees the city's operation while the city council provides policy direction and oversight. Charlotte is more than one man. And he also told us this was the first time that we were hearing that uh, pro tem Mayor Michael Barnes has called a special city council meeting. That will be Monday night. Reporting live now from the Government Center, Michelle Bowden, NBC Charlotte. Uh, Michelle, I thought it was interesting where he t said that uh, the city has a lot of checks and balances here. And this kind of thing is just not something that happens on a regular basis. 
Yeah, I think he's trying to make clear the point because, you know, so many times in the affidavit, uh, you know, former Mayor Patrick Cannon mentioned that he had sway with committees, and I think he was trying to make it clear that there are a lot of people involved, that there are those uh, checks and balances all along the way. So I think that's one point he wants to get out to everyone. Uh, made a point there as well that he says this is uh, the best city in America to invest in as well. So obviously he wants to make sure that people continue to keep an eye on the city of Charlotte when it comes to investment. I think very much so. It's top of mind that developers continue doing business here, that you know the Chamber of Commerce is able to still continue to recruit businesses. He talked about Speed Street and some of the big events. He says this is a big city, a fun city. So very much the reputation of the city is top of mind today. All right, Michelle Bowden reporting from City Hall. There, our team coverage takes us to Ballantyne now, where NBC Charlotte reporter Rad Berkey just got reaction from Governor Pat McCrory. And Rad, the two of them were very close friends. They really were close personal friends. The governor coming here today to Ballantyne, and on any other day, it would have been Patrick Cannon joining him at the ribbon cutting here for the new MetLife headquarters, but not today. In fact, it was Mayor Pro Tem Michael Barnes who joined the governor at the opening. McCrory said later that the city of Charlotte and its reputation would quickly recover from what happened. But as far as his own relationship with Pat Cannon, well, that was going to take some time. Uh, the wound is still um, open, and it's too early for me to comment on that. Uh, there's a personal there's a personal wound that's going to take a lot of time to recover with regards to that personal relationship. But my relationship to the city is... The governor did say that he would quickly begin working with the current city leadership now to help restore Charlotte's reputation and make it again a world-class city. Live in Ballantyne, Rad Berkey, NBC Charlotte. Rad, thank you. Over the years, the NBC Charlotte I team has repeatedly raised serious questions about Patrick Cannon using his office for his personal gain. And we aired those reports long before the FBI investigated him. Now, looking back, we can see investigative reporter Stuart Watson challenge Cannon in a way no other reporters did. Patrick Cannon's company, Easy Parking, won a lucrative contract with the Charlotte Convention Center way back in 2002 while he was on the city council. Patrick Cannon either knew some people that, had to, 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 that made the decision or that the people that made the decision was influenced because of, of, of who he was. At the time, Cannon assured me he would never profit from his influence. If there's anything that's out of line spiritually, morally, or ethically, uh, it's something that Easy Parking would not pursue. When losing bidders complained it looked like Cannon had a conflict of interest, here's what he told me. I think that's an unfair assessment. You know, the sky appears to be blue, but it's not, because 75% of the earth is water, and it reflects off of the ionosphere. So, I mean, appearances? No. But two years later, in 2004, the NBC Charlotte I team was again alone in asking questions about Cannon profiting from his position. This time, his company won a bid to provide parking services at Carolina's Medical Center, a public hospital, even though he was not the low bidder. Easy Parking's bid described Cannon as, quote, a highly visible member of the city council and said he had special access, quote, to contact the necessary authorities to promptly resolve any emergency. Uh, it's a typographical error, something shouldn't be there because obviously no one ever contacts me about those things anyway from CNC and I think it would be probably inappropriate for me to do, do that kind of thing anyway. But that is exactly what he's being charged with doing some 10 years later. It's inappropriate in my opinion to go out and use your title for, uh, for something that might uh, give you the edge per se. Again, Cannon insisted Easy Parking was just the best company for the job. I would imagine in CMC's mind, we were the best qualified to go in and to perform the job accordingly. Don't think it had anything to do with you being a highly visible member of the city council? I sincerely doubt that. <laughs> I've probably lost deals because I'm a member of the city council more than I've gained deals by way of being a member of the city council. Then three years ago, Cannon was again accused of using his influence. The issue back then was not his company, but a lucrative contract to provide taxicab service at the Charlotte Douglas Airport. The two winning bidders at the airport paid $5,000 each to be members of the Hospitality and Tourism Alliance, called the HTA. Patrick Cannon was on the HTA board 
and on the city council committee that oversaw taxicab licensing. Does the HTA get any more influence because Patrick Cannon is on its board? Absolutely not, and let me tell you exactly why. One is, is that Patrick Cannon is there by way of his company, his private business. He's not there by way of his public uh, hat that he wears. But Mohammed Mustafa, the owner of Universal Cab, complained bitterly that Cannon was corrupt. Now he feels vindicated. I pray God all along that the dark it come to light. And yesterday was the, all the dark had come back to light. And today, Mohammed Mustafa of Universal Cab says he took his evidence back to the FBI, which he says has renewed interest in the taxicab contract as this investigation continues. Stuart Watson, NBC Charlotte. And our team coverage takes us now to Patrick Cannon's home in South Charlotte, where the former mayor is keeping a low profile. NBC Charlotte reporter Tony Burbeck is live outside. And Tony, you've seen his wife, but, but not the former mayor. No, in fact, we have not, Dave. We have not seen former Mayor Patrick Cannon since our cameras caught him walking out of the federal courthouse yesterday in Uptown after his arrest on the federal corruption charges. And yeah, this is the video that you'll see only on NBC Charlotte of him coming out of the courthouse. Now, his resignation letter later on that night also came with a call for privacy from his attorney. And all we've seen at Cannon's house today on Cumner Lane and Ballantyne is his wife, Trina, leaving and coming back and doing that a couple of times. Now, some of Cannon's neighbors read the criminal complaint, they read the specifics, they delved into the recorded conversations about the alleged corruption, and yeah, there is a wide range of emotions out here, from people sad for his wife and kids to just plain wow. The evidence is just stuck like up against years, him. It's not uh, guilty until it's proof, but, you know, when the FBI have all these um, as the news says, uh, all the, the evidence, and so it's hard to, to think not. And neighbors also describe this tonight as a punch to the gut to the city of Charlotte. But at the same time, they think it is something that can be overcome. We're live tonight, Valentine, Tony Burbeck, NBC Charlotte. All right, FBI agents were not at Cannon's house today. The police car that stayed in front of his house all last night is gone. NBC Charlotte is digging deeper inside the complaint and highlighting the most interesting and important parts. NBC Charlotte anchor Bill McGinty has more on the trip to Nevada. Hey there, Angie. This federal complaint goes in depth about an undercover operation that took place in Las Vegas, during which Patrick Cannon allegedly was trying to lure big investors to Charlotte for big profits. How big, you might ask? $100 million big. The FBI undercover investigation of the soon-to-be Mayor Cannon landed in Sin City, Las Vegas, in early July of 2013. The FBI says Cannon accepted an all-expense-paid trip to Las Vegas, plus $6,000 in cash, all to meet with foreign investors about a possible $100 million real estate investment in Charlotte. Those foreign investors, as well as Cannon's supposed business partners along on the trip, were all undercover FBI. The complaint goes on to say that FBI agents provided Cannon with transportation to the hotel he selected, the room keys, a prepaid tour of Las Vegas, and $1,000 cash given to him in close proximity of his wife. In the meeting with undercover agents, Cannon allegedly promised he would speak to building inspectors, the chairman of the board of county commissioners, the county manager, and the head inspector over building standards. When asked how long he could help, the complaint alleges Cannon saying, for as long as I'm elected. And that last line is what this federal corruption case is all about, the alleged selling of political favors and influence. Dave? All right, Bill. Former city councilman and longtime Cannon friend James Mitchell has issued a new statement saying, quote, I've known Patrick a long time. We were fraternity brothers. We served Charlotte as elected leaders together for a decade. Obviously, I was shocked and saddened by the allegations, just as everyone was. The courts will determine whether he's guilty of the charges. And overnight, Republican mayoral candidate Edwin Peacock released a statement. It says, in part, this is a very sad day for our city. The people of Charlotte deserve nothing but the highest ethical behavior from our elected officials. The public trust has been shattered, and it now must be restored. Our prayers are with the Cannon family during this difficult time. The scandal is the talk of the town. Everyone around the city is chatting about it today. NBC Charlotte anchor Amy Cowman picks up our coverage with your reaction. 
As Charlotteans have had a day now to digest the news and many of them reading the affidavit for themselves, opinions certainly vary. <laughs> At first, voters say they were shocked to hear the former mayor's arrest and then quick resignment. But now, details of the bribery and other charges have been read and leaked out, from morning radio shows to talk on the street. It seems more than anger, voters have expressed disappointment in what seems to be a scandal that began long before Mayor Cannon took the oath to be mayor of Charlotte. You know, I feel like it's not a good representation of our city. It's not a good example. It's, it's definitely not appropriate what he's been doing. Politicians shouldn't do that. You know, they need to look out for the people and not for themselves. It's unfortunate if the accusations are true, but when you think about the corruption that's been going on in government um, all over the country, and then you look at the evidence that they have collected and what we've seen so far, it doesn't look good. It is shocking. It's appalling, but I, I just don't get involved in it too much. One thing many say is the disappointment in the short amount of time that Cannon was mayor just three months and the hopes they had had, but they still feel that Charlotte will move past this. In Uptown, Amy Cowman, NBC Charlotte. We also want to hear what you have to say about the allegations against Cannon. You can record a short video clip with your opinion and email it to us at yourpics at WCNC.com. We may put your clip on the air. Of course, you can depend on NBC Charlotte to bring you the very latest on this story. We are working 24 hours a day to bring you new information. When we're not on the air, you can find updates at WCNC.com. Nice day today after a cold, cold start this morning. We start the, started the nice warm up. I'll let you know how warm it's going to be as we go into the weekend. The Rock Hill grandfather accused of killing his nine year old granddaughter and wife and then shooting himself is now in a York County jail. Ronald Gregory was released from the hospital today. The 67 year old is charged with two counts of murder. Family members say Gregory was involved in a custody battle with the girl's other grandparents since her mom died last year. A popular Charlotte bakery known for staying open 24 hours a day will close its doors for the first time since 2009. Amelie's came under fire after a former manager publicly resigned and filed a complaint with the Department of Labor alleging they don't always pay overtime. Next Monday night, the owners of Amelie's will lock the doors for three hours to give those employees a chance to voice their concerns. The small business is bringing in outside facilitators to work with its employees. And we continue our coverage of the arrest and resignation of former Charlotte Mayor Patrick Cannon. This has been a developing story since we first broke news of his arrest yesterday afternoon. And since this interview, we have yet to hear from the former mayor. We do know he's free. He's out right now on bond. The FBI says it began its investigation of Cannon back in 2010. We have a team of reporters committed to bringing you answers and we will bring you new developments as they happen. So be sure to keep it here to NBC Charlotte. The most accurate forecast with the first worn storm team's Brad Penovich. All right, significant warm up today compared to yesterday at this time, but the clouds are going to start thickening up this evening as we go into the overnight. It'll be warm tomorrow again, but we're going to have to deal with some showers, especially as we go through the afternoon and keep an eye on Saturday. It's going to be warm on Saturday and won't be a washout, I would say, but there are going to be some strong, possibly severe storms around, especially Saturday afternoon. Look at the temperatures across the area. A lot of low 60s out there right now. Boone checking in one of the cool spots. 49 degrees, but as we go through the evening, relatively mild tonight. The south wind is helping us out, and with clouds increasing, we will not be as cold as the 24 we saw the last two mornings, which is incredibly cold for this time of year. There's only been five instances where it's been this cold on this date or after into the spring. I mean, we rarely see 24 degrees this late into the season. And if you're up in the Hickory area and areas west of Charlotte, you're probably smelling a little smoke or seeing some haze. That south wind is blowing in some smoke from some controlled burns down in South Carolina. There's several down here in the Midlands and the upstate of South Carolina and the surface. That south wind is really blowing in some of that moisture. Here's our big storm system over the middle of the country. Severe weather ongoing now. It's a two part system. The first part's going to arrive tomorrow with the chance of showers, heavy showers possible to our south. But for the most part, we're just going to see light showers. Saturday, different story. Big area of low pressure tracks right over the region. Saturday is looking more 
and more and more like a washout with the potential that some of these storms could be severe. And then on the backside, cold air loft is going to bring some snow to the North Carolina mountains, if you can believe that. We'll go into tomorrow. I'll notice, yeah, we're going to have some showers around, but not a washout. By evening, we get into a break. But as we go into Saturday, there could be waves of rain, one in the morning and maybe a second one in the afternoon. And we'll have to watch that second wave because the potential is going to exist that some of that could be severe. And then early on Sunday, we're going to see some snow and possibly some sleet or hail across the Piedmont with that cold air aloft. So severe weather threat on Saturday right now. If we see some storms, I'm thinking damaging winds, but hail actually could be a little bit higher as well. Tornado threat right now will keep it down, but if we see more sun and warmer air, it's something we'll certainly watch. Tonight, clouds are on the increase. We'll see showers arrive by sunrise with temperatures much warmer. Same story here in the Piedmont. We'll see rain arriving by about sunrise tomorrow. Again, it'll be light, I'm not talking heavy rain yet, but look at the overnight lows even east of Charlotte. Temperatures down is in the 40s and 50s. The weekend, Saturday looks to be wet, and we're going to have scattered showers around at least early Sunday and much cooler weather. But as we go into next week, that is going to be a great stretch of weather. Everybody was wondering if we were going to see another blast of cold air. This time, it doesn't look like it. I mean, we're talking maybe upper 50s, low 60s now is cold. And by next week, temperatures will be well into the 70s with lots of sunshine. April's a great month. It's one of our driest months of the season here in Charlotte. And so far, it looks like it's going to start that way. Thank goodness. Is yes. it safe to smile <laughs> at this point? Yes. I would say the, the winter stuff, we're done with. We're not going to see nothing about it. We will have some cool days, sure. but nothing like we saw in March or February. We'll, we'll take cool days. Yeah, we'll take cool days, particularly in August. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we are counting down to Uptown, and we're about a week away now from opening day at BB&T Stadium. This week, the Charlotte Knights unveiled four murals along the South Graham Street side of the new BB&T ballpark. The murals uh, commemorate the four former Charlotte area homes of professional baseball. You may recognize a few of those images like Lotta Park, Weirn Field, Griffith Park, and Knights Castle Stadium. Don't forget, opening day is Friday, April 11th. NBC Charlotte will bring you live coverage from that ballpark and we'll continue to post updates on the Countdown to Uptown online at WCNC.com. We'll be right back. There is a new name and a new look for Speed Street. The newly dubbed Coca-Cola Speed Street Festival celebrates its 20th anniversary in Uptown in May. This year's festival before the big Coca-Cola 600 NASCAR race begins on May 22nd. This year's musical lineup is out as well. The headliners include Who's Bad, the ultimate Michael Jackson tribute band, country music group Thompson Square, and southern pop rock Artist 38. Sound excited about that. <laughs> All right, take a look at this video from last night's Bobcats game against the Nets at Time Warner Cable Arena. U.S. Marine Josh Morgan, along with his wife and his baby son, they were invited to the game for what they thought was Military Appreciation Night. Back in 2011, Morgan was injured by an IED. Well, last night, his family was given a 100% mortgage-free home in Huntersville. Well, you can tell. He's really emotional. They're both oh, emotional. Of course, That yeah. is so cool. Nice Good surprise. for them. Oh, yeah, absolutely. All right, the news at 530 starts in just minutes.